about a very dynamic discussion about the future of investment and the impact of the anti-globalization movement. Please make yourselves comfortable. On behalf of UNCTAD, may I extend a big warm welcome to the Global Leaders Investment Summit. Gathered here in this wonderful assembly hall of the Palais des Nations, we have the heads of state of many countries, we have presidents, prime ministers, senior ministers, ambassadors. We have, I'm happy to say, the leaders of some of the biggest companies around the world, chairmen and CEOs. And of course, just as importantly, ladies and gentlemen, we have concerned global citizens. And we're all gathered here, however exalted and eminent, however humble, to discuss and debate the important questions before us. So in that spirit, ladies and gentlemen, we have decided to divide the Global Leaders Investment Summit into two parts for better discussion, to make for a more free-flowing discussion. So this is part one. Let me introduce us, introduce you to our eminent panelists. We have with us um, the President of Bangladesh, His Excellency Mr. Abdul Hamid. We have the President of Mongolia, His Excellency Mr. Halkma Bakula. We have with us the President of Montenegro, His Excellency Mr. Milo Djukanovic. And I'm pleased to say from nearer to home here in Switzerland, the CEO of one of the world's biggest pharma companies, Novartis, Dr. Vas Narasimhan, and chairman of the board of Nestle, Mr. Paul Bulka. So let's put our hands together for a warm welcome to our eminent panelists. <clears throat> to get our session going and to give us our opening address, here is the Secretary General of UNCTAD, Dr. Mokiso. Kitui, Dr. Kitui. Thank you very much, moderator. Your excellencies, members of the first summit panel, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, may I bid you welcome to day two of the World Investment Forum 2018. This headline event of the World Investment Forum convenes today around an issue of pressing concern for the investment community, the backlash against globalization and the crisis of multilateralism that has accompanied it. The need for these discussions is even greater today than it has been over the past years of the existence of the World Investment Forum. A few months later, the collapse of Lehman Brothers precipitated the largest financial crisis in modern times and a massive contraction in trade flows and FDI. Ten years ago, despite the fear of countries turning to protectionist instincts, economic nationalism was rather muted, thanks to the coordination of the world's largest economies and the support of international organizations like the United Nations. A decade on, the recovery has been slow and uncertain with extensive monetary and not enough fiscal policy. As we gather here today, rising economic policy uncertainties have increased the risks of global growth to global growth. This is compounded by the threat of a retreat from globalization, notably in trade and in our approaches to international economic governance. The dynamics of globalization have been driving a shift in the political landscape since the financial crisis 10 years ago. Political divisions are emerging that are characterized by a rift between those who have benefited from globalization and those who have not. Slow wage growth, lower social mobility, and sluggish policy responses to the need for structural economic change have led to rising inequalities. The resulting discontent has created trade disputes and a broader shift in the dynamics of international solidarity and a global partnership away from multilateralism. Ultimately, the stakes could be very high indeed, threatening our efforts to deal with existential threats such as climate change, migration, and threats to security. The ambitious agenda of the Sustainable Development Goals reminds us all that even without today's threats to the global economy and multilateralism, our task is hard enough in adopting the 23rd Agenda, 
the United Nations state member states committed to leaving no one behind in implementation of the SDGs. The policy challenges of today are partly driven by our collective failure to ensure that those most vulnerable enjoy the fruits of successful economic development. The failure to address this has far-reaching consequences, fueling conflicts, threatening global peace and security, and exposing people to the effects of climate change, and leaving those with insufficient means to feed their families with little choice but to migrate to where economic opportunities are perceived to be better. Global investment flows have not been immune to the consequences of the retreat from globalization. Investment flows have been stagnant since the onset of the financial crisis. And even when flows have risen a little, this has been due to, in part to tax optimizing corporation configurations, which contribute little to the development of productive capacity needed to work towards the SDGs goals. Last year, global FDI flows fell by 23%. Our data suggests this decline has continued into 2018, with flows weak across all developing regions. This weak investment climate should concern us all because investment by multinational firms in global value chains is one of the driving forces of the global economy. Multinational enterprises are responsible for almost a quarter of all global output and propel some 80% of international trade. However, ANCTA data indicates that growth in global value chains was negative in 2017, as measured by the share of imported goods and services integrated into a country's exports. Investment in SDG-related sectors is critical for the realization of Agenda 2030. At current levels of investment in SDG-relevant sectors, we are faced with an annual investment gap of between of, of about $2.5 trillion, an amount that outstrips the combined value of public investment aid flows and remittances to the developing countries. This lack of investment is not for lack of funds. Multinational enterprises have record cash holdings today the critical challenge that should be a central concern for global leaders is how to undertake collective policy actions to unlock investment for this purpose. Foreign direct investment remains the largest source of external finance for developing countries, together with ODA and remittances as major sources of funding LDCs. With this broad outline in mind, I invite you, Excellencies, to consider some key questions. One, how will the globalization backlash affect international investment and its impact on development? Two, what will be viable remedies in the investment policy making arena? And three, how can more people benefit from globalization and how can the United Nations make a useful contribution? These are just some of the questions to spark the discussion and I, wish, I want to wish you all a rich and fruitful discussion. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Mr. Dr. Kitui. So as we just heard from the Secretary General, the stagnant investment flows that we've seen over the last decade really matter. The stakes are high. Let's find out more now what's at stake. Our next address is from the President of Bangladesh, His Excellency Mr. Abdul Hamid. Mr. Hamid, please do take the floor. Your Excellencies, President of Mongolia and Montenegro, Prime Minister of Lito So, President of the UN General Assembly, Secretary General of UNTAC, Mr. Mukhisa Kitui, Distinguished Representatives of International Organizations and Multinational Companies, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. Assalamu alaikum and a very good morning to you all. It is indeed my great pleasure and honor to be 
with you in this beautiful city of Geneva to take part in the Global Leaders Investment Summit of the World Investment Forum. At the very outset, let me express my sincere thanks to the Antarctic Secretary General for inviting me to the summit. I also thank the Swiss government for extending warm hospitality and courtesies to me and my delegation. Excellency, globalization is not a very recent phenomenon, though, though we witnessed some of its discontent recently. Industrial revolution and scientific invest, inventions speeded up the process over the years. Unprecedented technological advancement in the 20th century and the resulting ever-enhancing connectivity brought revolution in transfer of goods and services. But benefits of the wealth did not reach everyone equally. On the other hand, using technology, international investment shifted production to places with lower skills and lower wages. In the process, employment was affected in some countries with unacceptable social cost. Consequently, doubt about economic integration or globalization and hostility to international trade, investment, and finance increased to a great extent. Against the backdrop, we may explore what remedies could be made in investment policy making so that more people could benefit from globalization. Dear friends, investment directly increases domestic expenditure and enhances the flow of capital, brings modernization and expands productivity. Foreign investment also introduces innovation to production process, increases competitiveness and help access to foreign markets. But investment also tends to go to places offering secured and quick return, ignoring those it could have contributed towards long-term sustainable development. Often does the developing countries and the LDCs suffer and continue to lag in infrastructure and connectivity needed to attract FDI and even domestic investment. And the current trend justifies that, according to Antarctic World Investment Report 2018, global FDI fell by 23% in 2017, and FDI to developing countries did not recover after a 10% drop in 2016. FDI to the LDCs also fell by 17% last year. It also says that though the global GDP continued to grow, the rate of expansion of international production was slowing down. The growth in global value chains stagnated. In addition, the rising prote protectionism is threatening the established multilateral system. So we have reasons to be concerned, especially because the last financial crisis and weakened globalization had a devastating impact on global economic growth, trade, and investment. Excellencies, export diversification, enabling investment policies, financial incentives, special economic zones, and availability of necessary infrastructure are factors which attract domestic and foreign direct investments. Regional integration also increases the flow of incoming investment in the in its south 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 form can be a, a good complement. Stable and predictable legal framework and well designed dispute resolution processes are needed. Otherwise investors would back away if the rules are changed frequently and abruptly. Distinguished participants we should make sure that investment also respect the preservation of environment and help sustainable development. We must, therefore, encourage the private sector to invest in the green and renewable energy by providing incentives and preferential treatments. And finally, we must invest more and more in our people, 
in their education and skill development. Only the right investment in our human capital can prepare us for the very demanding future. Dear friends, we need to assist the graduating LDCs by continuing the preferential treatment for a reasonable period. Second, by providing duty-free, quota-free access to them. Third, to increase private FDI to the LDCs, offer incentives to the private entities of the develop developed countries for transfer of technology in line with the TRIPS agreement. These and other similar measures will ensure more flows of FDI into the LDCs, facilitating greatly implementation of the SDGs by 2030. Ladies and gentlemen, sudden arrival and prolonged presence of more than one million Rohingyas in Bangladesh from Myanmar resulted into enorm enormous burden on our economy and the society. Still, we continue to keep harmony and progress under the visionary leadership of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina. We are moving to achieve the dream of Sunar Bangla or Golden Bengal as env envision by the father of the nation, Bongo Mundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. We are aspiring to become a developed developing country by 2021 and a developed country by 2020, 2041. To conclude, I will say that time and opportunity will not wait for us, and together we must act today for a better tomorrow. I again thank you all and UNTAC for this event. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamid. So a plea there for a continuation of the preferential LDC status for a reasonable period of time. I'm now going to invite the president of uh, Mongolia, His Excellency, Mr. Hatma Badgula, to take the floor. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, you may wish to use your headsets now. His Excellency, Mr. Mukisha Ketu, Secretary General of the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. His Excellency, Mr. Alain Bursi, President of the Swiss Confederation. Heads of the state and government leaders. I am delighted to participate in this August event being held on the occasion of the 10th anniversary of the World Investment Forum, which serves as a platform for exchanging views and ideas on how to improve the world trade and investment environment and step up investment cooperation. I wish to congratulate the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development and the Swiss government on the successful organization of this summit. Ladies and gentlemen, according to the Ingrats World Investment Report 2018, global flows of foreign direct investment fell by 23% last year. They fell by 41% as of the first half of this year compared to the same period last year. This is no increase in foreign investment flows to developing countries. These figures make this summit all the more important and timely. We, the international community, defined the Sustainable Development Goals to be achieved by 2030 in all sector areas, such as poverty reduction, education, health, environment and energy. Over the two and three years of Sustainable Development Goals implementation, investment flows have been fallen substantially and there is an increasing backlash against liberalization of global trade and investment in some countries. With those trends, we are virtually pushing Sustainable Development Goals towards the edge of the cliff. I would like to emphasize that an emerging technological divide between the developed and developing countries in relation to the new industrial revolution poses a daunting challenge for landlocked developing countries like Mongolia in the efforts to achieve sustainable development and implement goals set in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Therefore, our delegation is pleased to have an opportunity to join the six solutions to global and regional challenges at this forum and at its sessions. Distinguished delegates and guests, ladies and gentlemen, 
In 2016, Mongolia adopted its own Sustainable Development Vision 2030, based on 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Since then, we are developing and implementing our national level and intersectoral development policies in line with the Sustainable Development Vision 2030. We are planning to present a national voluntary report on the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in 2019. From my own country's experience, uh, furthermore, we are in the middle of formulating an integrated investment policy in strict conformity with sustainable development goals. The new policy will help enhance the structure of the relevant authorities and the coordination and increase effectiveness of investment. From my own country's experience, I can say confidence that investment has an enormous impact on development after reaching its peak in 2011 and 2012. Foreign investment in Mongolia fell sharply due to an unstable investment policy, impacting negatively on its economic growth. We have learned lessons from these bitter experiences and given its special attention to all levels of government by taking step-by-step -step targeted measures at both national and international levels. To illustrate, Mongolia established an Investor Protection Council and to a public-private consultative committee mandated to improve the legal environment for investment, promptly resolve complaints and grievances related to bureaucracy and illegal actions and take precautions against any risks. We also focused on developing a win-win investment agreement that ensures our country's interest and in equal footing by formulating a model bilateral investment agreement in accordance with the recommendations made by the AMCA. Foreign investment in Mongolia has been increasing over the past few years. A 2.5 times increase was recorded last year. Economic growth reached 5.3% last year and 6.3% in the first half of 2018. However, there is still a critical need to promote and attract more investment in sectors crucial for the implementation of sustainable development goals, such as agriculture, processing industries and infrastructure. In order to address this issue, we are working to improve legal environment for processing the markets of our trading and investment partner countries in increasing investment from those countries in Along with agriculture, renewable energy and tourism are the key sectors which Mongolia has had to develop rapidly. We propose to our Northeast Asian partner countries to implement a project called Northeast Asian Energy Supergrid designed to supply electricity to Northeast Asian countries using Mongolia's huge potential to produce renewables such as solar and energy. We invite you to work together with us in these sectors and make investments that will introduce new eco friendly technology. Ladies and gentlemen, today we find ourselves at the crossroads. We need to make a faithful decision for the future of humankind and have to handle the issue of investment that is so vital to achieving SDG. We need to choose whether our countries will broaden the cooperation or each country will act on its own. Shall we combine efforts to uh, achieve our common goals of reducing global poverty, increasing food supply and improving education and health in countries all over the world, or go backwards? We have reached a critical moment where we need to choose whether to address emerging issues in the global trade and investment system through collective will and effort or let ourselves fail. This summit should come up with ways to increase the effectiveness and quality of investment and to modify investment protection mechanisms. As another important outcome of this summit, states, investors and international organizations should reaffirm their commitment to work together to increase investment flows as an essential factor in achieving sustainable development worldwide. As a former professional athlete, I greatly value the role of sports and physical training in the development of an individual and self-discipline. Since I strongly believe that increasing investment in sports and physical education will contribute significantly to achieving objectives set out in sustainable development goals, such as empowering women and children, developing education and health care, and ensuring social equity. 
хөтөлбөрүүдийг дэмж ажиллахаа энэ дашир нь бас Taking this opportunity I wish to express my intention to support sports projects and programs involving not only Mongolia but also countries in our region I wish you a successful forum thank you for your attention So a very passionate and uh, individual appeal there from the president of Mongolia, including his commitment to sport and his belief that it uh, has empowering qualities. And of course, the reason why we're all here, which is an appeal for us to come together and restate our commitment to the SDGs and put commitments behind words. So it's now my pleasure to introduce you to our next head of state, the president of Montenegro, His Excellency, Mr. Bilo Djokan Milo Djokanovic. Mr. Djokanovic. And again, you may wish to use your translation headsets. Poštovani generalni sekretare, gospodo presjednici, Poštovani predsjedniče vlade Lesota, predstavnici multinacionalnih kompanija, uvažene ekselencije, dame i gospode. Zahvaljujem na pozivu za učešće na svjetskom investicijskom forumu i na prilici da predstavim naš pogled na ovu značajnu temu i iskustva Crne Gore. Decenije trajanja foruma najbolje potvrđuje njegov značaj. On je postao važno mjesto dijaloga hiljada aktera iz različitih oblasti koji zajedno rade na unapređenju globalnog investicijskog ambijenta. Teme inspiriše da se kroz perspektivu među zavisnosti investicija, trgovine i razvoja to take interdependence of investment trade in development as a framework to analyze where we are on our path to achieve sustainable development goals 2030. Traditional way of thinking cannot be used to interpret globalization phenomena because many old paradigms no longer work. Market economy does not divide countries to large or small, but to successful and unsuccessful. By building strong institutions, Successful economies create conditions for faster economic growth and development. And it is the rules of the game that make environment conducive to economic development. Therefore, the key challenge that globalization brings is to continue shaping the rules that support functioning of international institutions. Opponents of globalization are concerned that the benefits of trade and investment are not equal to everyone, for everyone. but they have never been. However, this way of thinking could lead to closing of some economies and development of protectionism. We must not accept such policies, because if they get stronger, they could jeopardize global investment flows. Montenegro remains firmly committed to preserving multilateralism, adherence to the rules and strengthening of transparency based on the WTO principles, which is particularly important for attracting foreign investments. We have proven this by our policy on the national level, among other things, when we adopted the National Sustainable Development Strategy 2030. We did it two years ago. Economic development is a multifaceted process that changes the structure of every society. It does not change the GDP only. It is a much larger package of changes. That means that we may not limit our intellectual abilities to what we currently are, but that we should aim at what we could become. Thus, economic development is not a goal in itself, but it is a tool to improve the quality of life and freedom to enjoy. In Montenegro, we are building a transparent system that has been attracting an increasing number of investors here a significant number of them are the so-called global players. And it is not the challenges only that their projects are faced with in our small economy. They are also faced by certainty, stability and clear rules. And they become the best promoters of Montenegro as a prestigious and high-quality investment destination. Results we have achieved show our strategic determination to work continuously on improving conditions for foreign investors. This is confirmed in Terralia by UNTAC statistics. In 2017, South East Europe attracted foreign investment in the amount of 5.5 billion dollars, which is a 20% growth in comparison to the year before. 
in Montenegro since the restoration of our independence in 2006, this growth has been 30%, which ensures that Montenegro can rank at the European top when it comes to foreign direct investment measured both per capita, which is 800 euros, and by FDI share in the GDP, which is around 18% annually on average. In the same period, this gave a significant impetus to the average economic growth of about 3% annually. Net inflow of foreign direct investment in this period amounted to over 6 billion euros. Another proof of the fact that Montenegro is an open country that participates in global trends can be found in tourism whose share in GDP is about 20%. In the country with a population of about 650,000, we had about 2 million tourists in 2017. This year, growth has been recorded in other sectors like industry and construction, which influenced faster real growth of exports of goods of service and services. Through competitive business environment with significant potentials in the field of energy, tourism and agriculture, Montenegro offers numerous advantages to foreign investors. We have harmonized our legislation with the EU key. Through more efficient judiciary and institutions that provide protection and certainty of smooth business operation, we have strengthened the rule of law. We have reformed our banking system. We have put foreign and domestic investors in the same position in terms of right that they can exercise. And we have liberalized foreign trade system. And on top of it, on top of this, our currency is Europe, which clearly shows that money supply can be increased only in the market. With a profit tax rate of 9% and personal income tax rate for physical persons of 9% or 11%, Montenegrin tax system is competitive. We are on the way to become an energy hub for the region as well. Together with Italy, we are finalizing the construction of an undersea power cable between our two countries and 400 kW transmission line that connects Montenegro, Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. This will link the region to the European energy market. This is the project co-financed by the European Union through Berlin process. In 2017, economic growth rate in Montenegro amounted to 2.74%, while in the first and in the second quarter of 2018, it amounted to 4.5 and 4.9 respectively. Investors obtain direct financial investment incentives for new projects in Montenegro. They get tax reliefs for investing in underdeveloped parts of our country. They get subsidies for employment in business zones and competition between local governments in setting the fees and local taxes for new investments. But what we are primarily focused on are the values of modern civilization that we are adopting through foreign investment, because they bring long-term advantages to our society. One of the key economic values is the fact that our economy is open. The fact that our country is politically stable, a NATO member, a leader in the advanced negotiation process with EU, WTO member and a signatory to numerous free trade agreements that ensure access to the market of 800 million customers, clearly confirms the political values that we have adopted and that we are committed to keep affirming. The amalgam of the developed economic and political values and our persistence in strengthening them further indicates to the investors that they are welcome to start business in our country and contribute to the strengthening of economic cooperation and raising of social, cultural, scientific, management, technical and technological standards. I would like to thank UTAD for the support in the establishment of the electronic portal of Montenegro legislation. Doing this, we raised the level of transparency and we made our legislation easily accessible both to potential investors and to the public. Recognizing the importance of UTAD's work, and values of the World Investment Forum, Montenegro show, shows how it appreciates the possibility to contribute to the implementation of the ideas that we share and to the strengthening of our common values. I am personally honored to be a part of this event. I appreciate and support this unique opportunity that we have to work together on improving investment policy with a view to achieving sustainable development goals by 2030. With that in mind, I think that we should also work together on confirming the development benefits that result from trade and investment.
od postavljenih ciljeva iz agenda. Stoga jedini smjer našeg djelovanja će biti rad u pravcu stvaranja ambijenta u kojem strane investicije i slobodna trgovina mogu da napreduju i da se postavljeni ciljevi održivog razvoja tako realizuju. Sve drugo bilo bi nedovoljno odgovorno prema sadašnjim i prema budućim generacijama. Hvala vam na pažnju. Thank you so much, Mr. Djokanovic. So, uh, a statement then, not just of the economic benefits of FDI, but also of the impact, the transformative impact it has on the values of a country in terms of its openness, in terms of its fairness and its regional cooperation. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Mr. Djokanovic. I'm now going to ask uh, the CEO of uh, Novartis, one of the biggest pharma companies in the world, possibly the biggest company. I don't know what you're going to say, Dr. Vass. Dr. Vass, Narasimhan, to talk to us about the way in which Novartis invests around the world. Great, thank you. Uh, to, uh, I'd like to thank your excellencies, the Honorable Umtad, uh, and all of you for the opportunity to address some of perspectives from a global multinational pharmaceutical company. Novartis is one of the largest companies uh, in the world investing in healthcare. We produce over 70 billion doses of medicine every year, reaching over 1 billion patients. Every year, we innovate medicines that try to rethink how we can treat cancer, how we can treat heart disease, how we can uh, treat blindness. And we've been doing this for over 100 years. Our goal is to reimagine medicine, and what I can say as a public health physician who has worked in low- and middle-income countries, I would want nothing more than to see us continue to be able to invest in the healthcare capabilities and healthcare capacities of the countries gathered in this room. Now, our investment profile is significant. We invest over $9 billion a year in R&D. We have over 60 manufacturing facilities all around the world. We market our medicines in over 152 countries, most of which we have some form of operations in. And we're constantly faced with investment decisions. We fundamentally believe we need open trade and we need a globalized uh, economy to be able to be successful in bringing these healthcare innovations to patients all around the world. I wanted to provide some perspective on how we think about where we invest these, these precious resources and how, in the future, the countries gathered here might be able to attract that investment more effectively. The first area I would want to highlight is the importance for an innovation company based company like ours is building an innovation ecosystem. By that I mean the ability to combine universities, venture capital, capital markets to be able to allow entrepreneurs and innovators to create new ideas and ultimately enable those ideas to generate financial returns. We fundamentally believe that is critical for our company's success. Now we participate that, in that in countries, in developing countries through our clinical trials and clinical research. We invest in clinical research in over 50 countries, including in many countries in Africa. And that can create a virtuous environment. That can create an environment where we invest in medical infrastructure, we invest in human capabilities, that improves the quality of healthcare, it improves the uh, ability to attract future investment, and a, and a positive cycle is created. The other element I think now, more than ever, in creating innovation ecosystems is going to be around digital and data science. And we've experienced this ourselves. We have global hackathons where we invite countries from all around the world, including countries from, de uh, including developing countries to participate. And most recently, two of the winners came from developing countries, including one from Ghana, where we invest in their ideas. And I think it's a powerful example of what's possible uh, when we start to believe in digital and data science. The second area we're deeply interested in is human capital. I think many of you have surely seen the World Bank's recent report on the importance of investing in human capital. We fundamentally are in a war for talent every day. We need the best minds in the world to find these new medicines and make them accessible to people all around the world. And so enabling higher quality human capital is fundamental. Now we try to do this ourselves by investing in developing country researchers. We have a next generation scientist program where actually just this week we inaugurated yet another class of next generation scientists who come visit our research centers to learn about the challenges of drug discovery and development and then have the opportunity to return to their home markets where they have the opportunity hopefully to innovate new medicines and contribute to the local economies. 
We also believe here we have the opportunity to invest further in digital and data science talent all around the world. The third area I would want to highlight is in the investment microclimate. While a lot of the discussion will be on the macroeconomic factors that drive foreign investment, often for us it's the microclimates that are created. The example I would offer is in Hyderabad, India, where in 2005, long before the big boom happened in outsourcing to India, we began investing in Hyderabad due to the strong commitment of the chief minister there. Over time now, we have over 5,000 uh, people now in Hyderabad, including some of our most important centers for uh, drug development, uh, as well as our, our data operations. That was because of the consistency we saw in the investment in infrastructure and in creating a regulatory environment where we could invest with confidence. We've had similar examples in other parts of the world. So I, I believe creating those investment microclimates matter, along with many, fixing many of the macroeconomic factors. The fourth, and perhaps most importantly, is to enable globalized markets to develop. And markets for healthcare are where we ultimately invest. Now, we know there is a long road in order to be able to invest in the fundamental healthcare infrastructure that will allow innovative medicines to reach the patients that need them. And we believe you have to take a very long view to this. So through our Novartis Access Program, we invest in countries ranging uh, from Vietnam and Pakistan to Kenya and uh, Cameroon to enable the access to our non-communicable disease medicines at a dollar per dose per month, a very low cost, in order to help access to medicines and hopefully over time build the environment that will enable markets to be created and then ultimately enable us to invest further. So those are the four areas that I would say are top on our mind when we think about investing. Now, fundamentally, we believe that we need a globalized economy to succeed. As I said, we operate in over 150 countries. But I'd also want to leave you with the sentiment that from a global company like ours, the sentiment is very strong that we need the STGs to also be successful. Fundamentally, as I said, our goal and our mission is to reimagine medicine and to bring that health care to as many people as possible. So certainly our commitment is to keep investing in places all around the world that are committed to health care and to hopefully sustainably help achieve the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vass, for putting very succinctly the four pillars of investment for Novartis. The ones that really struck me were the innovation ecosystem that you were talking about and also the necessity to have a commitment and consistency in the countries you're investing in so that you can commit to the long term. I'm sure you had other takeaways, ladies and gentlemen. Now I'd like to introduce you to Mr. Paul Bulka, who is the chairman of Nestle, one of the biggest multinationals, as we all know. Mr. Bulka. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, Unta, to invite me to be part of this panel. Also, Your Excellencies, to share your thoughts here on the panel as such. And I, I, I was listening to you and say, we, we do have a lot in common, uh, and yet in so different uh, industries. But I want to share with you one uh, fact, maybe uh, one conviction and then some beliefs. Th th my first conviction is that, that an integrated world is better off than a disintegrated world. The world globalization has and starts to have a, a little bit of a bad flavor, but are we talking about globalization? Actually, we're talking about integration. An integrated world, that actually the economical integration that started in the 90s very, uh, in very, very f um, visible form, has been so good for so many people. Hundreds of millions of people went out of poverty. And yet, the problem is not all have been uh, benefiting from it. And that is what creates a backlash. But we should see the positive side of it too, which is the hundreds of millions that went out and it's not done yet. And so integration definitely is a, is a fact, is a belief. It is positive for uh, the world. Um, that's definitely not a solution to turn, um, to turn yourself inwards. Uh, and disintegrate. That's the first belief or conviction. Another belief is the role of, of the private sector. What can the private sector do? What should the private sector do? And then at the same time I'll say what should it not do? And the private sector is, is, is a dimension in society that creates jobs, that does the innovation, 
um, that McLean was talking about, um, that actually also shares best practice, that looks into the local dimensions of the communities it works in, and, and, and look for resources and tries to combine them uh, for the maximum outputs in the most efficient way. It is also the dimension that invest. It invests in capital, very importantly, where it operates, but also in human capital, and it was mentioned already here too. That is what the private sector should do. That's our work. And to do that, we have a framing of long-term commitment to the societies, the communities it is engaged in. Governments should create a framing, a framing that allows uh, the, the, the private sector society to flourish. And to do that, uh, in base of the mandates that, that they got from from uh, the society, and to do that in an enabling framework so that has this consistency in time, very challenging dimension, consistency in time. That is what governments should do. They should also engage in the multilateral uh, systems, the working with the international institutions because no problems can be solved alone, and, and that dimension should be stressed again somewhere. We have, then you have civil society. They should have a voice, they have a voice, and they have an increasing voice now, also through social media. They're actually framing also and putting uh, milestones or, or reference points so that we can challenge ourselves versus these dimensions. It's a critical voice, and we should listen. And between all of them, I think we should work together. That is what building stakeholders is all about, an open and dialogue. And actually, on this panel, that's a proof of it. That's why we are sitting here also in this room. That's also why I feel compelled to and so motivated to be here. Now, uh, another belief is also a, a private sector, companies, small or big, local, international, multinational, whatever. So, uh, and, and private sector, a company should have a fundamental belief that it is not only there for shareholder value creation per se. It has to take care of the shareholders, definitely. But in everything it does, there's a fundamental conviction that at least I live for, and 340,000 people in Nestle live for, it is that it should create value for society through what it produces, how it produces, and why it produces it. It is through this whole value chain creating value for the societies, the communities it lives in. And that is a fundamental belief that we call creating shared value. It is the combination, it is combining the what we do with the how we do it, but also and more fundamentally why we do it. And it's a fundamental conviction that I see more and more explicit than many, many of the colleagues and other companies that you cannot fool society. You should be linking up with society the long term and that includes environmental, social, and economical long-term development. We are Nestle are active in 190 countries. That we do have people on the payroll. We have 450 factories in the world in over in almost 100 countries. And we are linking up with local value chains, local raw materials, because food is local. That's definitely our activity. Companies should see where they can create shared value more intensively through what they stand for, what they do. And in our, in our reality, that is linked with agriculture, uh, uh, upstream connections and long-term commitments to the agriculture communities. We invest, for example, uh, Southwest Africa region. In the, last, in the last five years, we invested one billion there, uh, also in an R&D center in Abidjan. In, 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 in our supply chain, agriculture supply chain, be it cassava, be it sorry, coffee, be it cocoa, and so on. And to do that, uh, we have to have this full conviction and trust in the local framing that gives us government somewhere. But this is also for a company to stand put in good and bad times. And that is something that I believe should be more explicit. Stay put, do it for the long term, commit to societies, and don't run away whenever you have a bit of headwinds. Government should help to allow that to happen. Our commitment is to stay there and to be part of all these communities and, and societies and creating and to do creating shared value. Thank you. 
So we must test him on that. Our commitment is to stay there. And that's a question I'm going to put to you in the, in the questions that follow Mr. Borka. How, does he, how do they stay through thick and thin? But before that, I'd like to open this discussion up to ask the big question that Dr. Katui put to us right at the beginning in his introductory words. And that is, we are facing some kind of backlash. We're facing some kind of kickback against globalization and its benefits, which seems baffling in so many ways. What impact is that having on investment? Is that really why investment has collapsed? And what, if anything, can we do about that? And the first question I'd like to put is to um, Your Excellency Mr. Hamid, the President of Bangladesh. We heard from you, Mr. Hamid, how Bangladesh is striving to graduate from the LDC category, but like many developing countries, you too are affected by this backlash of globalization, at least I assume you are. So tell us, sir, what can LDCs like Bangladesh do to try and be more resilient in the current climate? Sir. I think you may need a hand mic. Thank you for your question and important one of Bangladesh. I'm happy to say that earlier this year, Bangladesh fulfilled all the three criteria of graduation from LDC status. We hope that by 2024, we will become a developing country. We need to diversify our export and domestic production. Then our trade needs to be made inclusive. In this, we need policies that give priority to women, young people, small business, and help to spread technology and develop e-commerce and digital economy. In addition, the existing benefits should continue for a reasonable period for the graduation, graduating LDCs. We also expect the developed countries to honor their promise to providing ODA and contribute to fight against climate change on a priority basis. need to more supportive international framework. The international community should do more for the LDCs to ensure a smooth, non-reversible graduation and implementation of SDGs. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And I'd like to put that question to Mr. Jokanovic as well. You were telling us uh, in your opening statement that actually um, investment in Montenegro has held up very well. You have not had a huge drop off in FDIs in the last few years, and that has supported growth. So in that case, can we actually say that you have faced any kind of backlash from globalization? Is it actually a concern for you in Montenegro, or have you been immune to it in some way? You registered well. In Montenegro, we have not yet felt any drop in investments. On the contrary, in my introduction, I said... Sir, please hold it up close to your, to your mouth, the mic. Hold it close. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, as I said, you noticed well, in Montenegro we have not yet felt the drop of investments. On the contrary, in my opening statement, I said that the growth of investments is more dynamic than in any other country in the region that we live in, and that it is the most dynamic in Europe, measured by the share of foreign direct investments in GDP and FDI per capita. This actually shows that the anti-globalization campaign that is on the stage does not actually produce the effects that they would like to have and does not produce the equal or same consequences for everyone. I sincerely hope 
pitanje nerazumijevanja ili pitanje zakašnjelog pokušaja da se vratimo u neko vrijeme koje je definitivno ostalo iza nas. Prije svega moramo da razumijemo da je ovaj svijet već globalizovan, da je IT revolucija koja teče već učinila svoje. Danas pokušaj da se stvari vrate natrag zaista djeluju bez nadležnost. To još vjeruje da je moguće povratiti pozdenu zavijesu u Evropu. is in vain. Nobody believes that the Iron Curtain can be back in Europe. That's insane. So this process is in progress and it goes forward. And Montenegro, as the state, that I present with all its performances is an excellent illustration and we have shown the commitment to an open and integrated global market and we have shown our commitment to multilateralism. I sincerely think that we talk, when we talk about this topic, we have to understand that this is not a matter of small and big. Look at some of the most successful economies in the world, Singapore, Luxembourg, you will understand immediately, it's not about the numbers, it's not about the size of the country, it's not about the mineral resources that are huge, no, it's about the rules, and the rules are very inspiring for investors. We put our efforts into complying with that, into behaving that way. We try to design a solution every day that will be inspiring for the investors because we need them. We need private-public partnership to achieve our goal, and that is the new quality of life for our people. Okay, so a very positive and punchy statement there about how to buck the trend. Um, I'm going to put the same question now to both um, Dr. Vass and to Mr. Bulka. So, Dr. Vass, is this really an issue for you at Novartis, this thing that we're talking about, anti-globalization, the great bogey in the room? So, you know, I would say not today, but there are, I think, concerning rhetoric and concerning um, at least uh, trends that one should, can worry about. For us, it's really twofold. One is innovation today is lar largely globalized. Our ability to share information across borders, our ability to learn from one another, our ability, particularly in medical innovation, to share knowledge, even to share samples, is something that's largely enabled us to have the incredible gains in life expectancy that medicines have, have created. Increasingly, you hear rhetoric about slowing that interconnectedness of innovation, and that's certainly of concern. And the second is global supply chains. I mean, for us, we produce our medicines. All of our medicines are produced across a network of, of facilities, as I mentioned, that move around continents all around the world. That enables us to do this efficiently, cost-effectively. Uh, and I think certainly the, the concern is we increasingly hear trends towards wanting to nationalize certain elements of, of supply chains. But fortunately, I would say today, that has not happened, and my, my belief is ultimately the global community won't let it happen because I think the lost gains to humanity will be significant, and our ability to really deliver on the SDGs is underpinned by a global economy. So can I just ask you what you meant by that, the a potential threat to nationalize certain elements of the value chain? Yeah, absolutely. So, so there uh, it is, I think, uh, there are moments where we're asked in order to be able to have access to medicines in a given country that we produce it locally, that we build manufacturing sites uh, locally, and that every, everything happens locally rather than leveraging the, the And that's perfectly chain. understandable, though, isn't it, that sentiment? It is, but I think it's probably, it, it is for the detriment of ultimately patients, because I think it will disrupt our, our ability to make these medicines as effectively and efficiently as possible. Okay, thank you. So that's a, that's a call for trying to resist these, these trends. Mr. Bulka, is this really something that you even notice at, um, at Nestle? You're telling us about 450 factories around the world. Can, can the globalization backlash touch a company like Nestle? Well, first of all, we should resist it uh, because you heard my conviction that an integrated world is much better off than a disintegrated world. But uh, we are de facto quite a decentralized uh, company because uh, uh, food and 
uh, and, and raw materials are local. We have many factories, so we, uh, we, we basically sell uh, products. 95% of what we uh, uh, sell is produced basically locally. But uh, we don't have to fool ourselves. If, if, if that anti-globalization and, and digging their heels, inward-looking, uh, disintegration continues, although I do believe the same as my colleague here, it's not going to have a lot of, uh, of possibilities to really prevail over time, uh, but then it would be not good for, 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 for society and, and the world at last, uh, and, and at large. So um, it's very strange to see that all the digital integrates the world, actually it integrates the world dramatically, and yet the physical world is trying to separate. So. I do feel actually digital is going to help to flatten the world again a little bit and integrate it. So but we have, to, we, we have to be aware of something, though. It should be inclusive somewhere, because um, uh, the backlash of globalization is not globalization per se, because it has helped. But some people were left on the sideline. And there, and it can, that is global, worldwide, also in countries, this inclusive dimension should really be taken seriously. And, and we, we all have a role to play there. So Dr. Vass was telling us about some moves towards nationalizing the, the value chain in pharma. Do you see in, in consumer goods, uh, in Nestle, uh, any kind of backlash against global brands, for instance, Mr. Borker? Well, that touches a, a more fundamental feeling in society. Big is bad. Institutions are bad, local is better, uh, small is better. It's a more fundamental philosophical question here in society. We should try, and we have a job to do here, to, to maintain a, the, the sympathy and empathy of society towards institutions. You're one of them here. So, uh, uh, so there's a work to do to connect and keep connection. And, and, and our brands is basically a, a way to connect with consumers. I must say there's... Um, there is some tension there, small brands uh, versus big brands and all. Uh, but yet again, there, uh, our brands are felt as quite local, although they have a global dimension. So that's our job to maintain this empathy and to be also relevant to consumers. Consumers demand of brands not only what does it give to me, it is also who is behind it. How does that company behave? So it's a much more, I would say, integrated concept of what the brand stands for. And it's for us to, to build that into the brands and to behave also accordingly. Okay, so I, I want to look at another aspect of FDI now, ladies and gentlemen, with your permission. A big aspect, surely, of whether a in country in, uh, attracts investment is not just because of the stable environment, the legal framework, the investor pol uh, facilitation, but also because of geopolitics, because of geography, where it happens to be located, right? We can't escape our geography. So this is a question... If, I, if you don't mind, for the president of Mongolia, Your Excellency Mr. Batulga. So Mongolia is sandwiched between two major powers, right? Russia and China. Russia under severe sanctions, uh, China in the midst of a trade war. What impact does that have on Mongolia? It must surely squeeze you, sir. Thank you, Villa. Thank you. A uh, very interesting question. So the global situation is escalating without our involvement. And it's very obvious that uh, we will not move away from our neighbors. Therefore, we are cooperating with our neighbors in accordance with the current circumstances. For instance, we are currently working together to implement the Mongolia-Russia-China economic corridor, aligning the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative and the Eurasian Economic Union with Mongolian Development Program. So, in this regard, we have agreed to jointly implement 32 projects and to these projects, not only China and Russia, but also entrepreneurs from third countries are welcome to invest in these projects. And we, as a Mongolia, geopolitically, uh, has a very uh, advantageous location. 
and Mongolia has a first tenth position in the sector of renewable energy. So this is a great advantage for us. And we have also initiated to establish a regional renewable energy grid, the Northeast Asian Super Grid project, uh, which we can share the load. Uh, we will continue during the policies of actively developing bilateral and multilateral trade and economic cooperation with regional countries. So this uh, project that I called Northeast Asian Super Grid Project, which is designed to share the load during the peak hours and which is a resource efficient and optimal solution for supplying Northeast Asian countries with energy. This joint project aims to construct energy complex and directed to uh, high voltage transmission line from solar, wind, and coal resources. So the research and feasibility study of the complex are completed, and the construction work will commence shortly. So Mongolia as a country with vast territory can help reduce loads during peak hours in Japan and Korea with its energy production from solar and wind resources by utilizing seasonal and time differences and as well as a backup energy sources. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Batuga. That's a great prize if you can pull it off, providing that regional energy hub to as far afield as Japan and, and uh, South Korea. So good luck with it. It's not going to be easy. Um, so we were just hearing also about the Belt and Road Initiative, which M Mongolia is part of too. And China, as we know, has provided FDI in many, many parts of the world including in Europe. And I, I'd like to find out now, really, whether there's been some kind of impact on Montenegro, too. Mr. Djokanovic, are there, have you benefited? Are there opportunities and challenges from the availability of Chinese investment funding? What are your thoughts on that, Mr. Djokanovic? Well, definitely, we have benefited from that. Uh, because we are now implementing a huge project with the Chinese project, company. It is the most expensive infrastructure project that Montenegro has ever had in its history, and that is the highway project. In addition to this, as you said, we see and hear criticism that Montenegro received because of that from very important centers in Europe, because we have had arrangements with Chinese companies. This also means borrowings for us. We have to take loans. It is impossible to implement such projects from the budget. Every country goes into such projects on the basis of loan or through private, public partnership if the conditions are more favorable. But whatever we have done, we have done this after a very thorough analysis and thinking. And there is no doubt that we will meet all our obligations in time and on the date, due date. The whole question of the controversy uh, of the Chinese presence in Europe is the question for the officials of the European Union, actually. In the new light of this trade expansion of China everywhere in the world and in Europe, there is a need for the European Union to rethink the agenda of their rules and economic relations with China. I would say that every serious country and every serious alliance has to do that timely. I hope, therefore, that Europe, when they start working on the updating of their foreign and economic policy, will do that more timely and in a more high-quality manner than a couple of years ago when they worked on redefining their economic interests and relations with 
lokomotiva razvoja evropskog kontinenta. Svoje razmišljanje treba da usmjeri u pravcu šta ona može da ponudi regionu kakav je jugoistočna Evropa. Dakle, ukoliko želi da bude da bude brža od Kine i brža od drugih, ona mora da ponudi svoj paket. Svoj paket ponudi, a to znači prije svega da ostane dosledna u realizaciji vizije Ujedinjene Evrope, a ne da se premišlja kao što se u realizaciji vizije Ujedinjene Evrope, a ne da se premišlja kao što se u realizaciji vizije Ujedinjene Evrope, a ne da se premišlja kao što se u realizaciji vizije Ujedinjene Evrope, a ne da se premišlja kao što se u realizaciji vizije Ujedinjene Evrope, a ne da se premišlja kao što se u realizaciji vizije Ujedinjene Evrope, a ne da se premišlja kao što se u za razvoj infrastrukture u tom regionu. Dakle, ko ometa Evropu da ona ponudi u svom jugoistočnom regionu ono što Kina nudi. A to su uslovi za izgradnje infrastrukture uz kredite na 20 godina po kamatnim stopama od 2% i po uzgrajs period od 7 godina. Dakle, to ni jedna zemlja ne bi propustila, posebno ne bi propustila nerazvijene zemlje u Uistočnoj Evropi koje treba da izgrade svoju infrastrukturu. Dakle, Evropa mora svoje napore da usredsredi ovo što unije, mora svoje napore da usredsredi da pomogne razvoj jednog regiona kako je Uistočnoj Evropi. So, a challenge there to the EU to wake up and smell the coffee. They have a, a serious threat in terms of uh, investment opportunities from China, ably spelt out by His Excellency, uh, Mr. Djokovic. Now, I would like to move on, ladies and gentlemen, to address the huge issue of the global goals. The world three years ago came together to sign up to these ambitious targets that nobody should be left behind. We are already three years into that process and what has been achieved in the last three years. We have only 12 years to go and then 2030 will be upon us. We heard from Dr. Kituri at the beginning that there is a two and a half trillion dollar funding deficit. Where is the money going to come from? I'd like to put this first to His Excellency Mr. Hamid from Bangladesh and then to our private sector um, representatives. What is the responsibility of the private sector? What is the responsibility of governments to try and attract investment into the vital SDGs? So, Mr. Hamid, sir, what is it that LDCs like Bangladesh can do to try and make sure that economic pro progress and the, the tantalizing, the invaluable goals of the SDGs are actually achieved. Sir, the floor is yours. Please repeat, is it the the backlash of globalization. Backlash, yes, how is, how, how is, why do you think it is that with investment collapsing, we've been talking about this black pleasure of globalization, how are we ever going to achieve the SDGs? What is it that countries like Bangladesh and other LDCs can do to try and achieve the SDGs and make sure that we are not thrown even further off track as the clock is ticking, sir? Well, thank you very much for your question. Personally, I will not overstate the effects of so-called backlash against globalization. I explained this in my full version of speech, but could not say due to lack of time. In addition, I may say that the so-called backlash developed in few countries with protectionist political ideas. These countries are opposed to global free market economy and the free movement of goods and services, including the movement of the people. Now, it is our common responsibility to convince our people that working together, acknowledging each other's strength and weakness in the win-win solution. And isolation and re Retaliation is not the answer, and the cost of isolationism is too much to afford for everybody. More connectivity, connectivity is always associated with 
more economic and social benefits. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And so I'm going to ask our two private sector representatives. There is this gap. What can the private sector do to try and help? Because we are not on track at the moment. Dr. Vass, you were telling us about the Access to Medicines project that you have. Is that really your main commitment to the SDGs? Does it go further than that? You know, fundamentally, as a company that, I, as I said, that distributes 70 billion uh, doses of medicine every year around the world, we are constantly trying our best to contribute to, to the SDGs. I think most fundamentally what we do is through our access to medicines programs, where we uh, enable access to millions of, uh, of patients who wouldn't otherwise have access to these medicines. I also would say our work in tropical medicine, in, in malaria, in tuberculosis, uh, in leprosy, which ultimately reaches the poorest of the poor's most pressing health healthcare needs. So I think clearly as, as a private sector, we need to do our part. But it goes hand in hand. I mean, there's still many countries in the world that if you look at the recent human capital report from the World Bank, uh, invest less than 5% of GDP in healthcare. In some cases, 2% of GDP in health. No matter how much access to the medicines we provide, unless there's a, a lifting of infrastructure for healthcare delivery, there will be challenges in reading, le, uh, reaching the, the so, so what do you SDGs. mean by that? Can you give us an example? You're so, saying you, you could... So if, you, if, if we say we, uh, of course, want to address um, childhood mortality, fundamentally we need the primary care infrastructure in order to be able to identify the children who have the, the various conditions that we're trying to treat, typically upper respiratory disorders. That takes basic investment in, in primary care. We try to do our part. We certainly should do more as a global company. We're, I have an aspiration that our company does more in these areas. But I, I, even as a global company, there's a limit to, to, to so, what So you we provide, can do. Can, can, you make a lot of cancer drugs. Are they also included in the Access to Medicine program? We are now expanding our access to, to cancer drugs as well. Now, fundamentally, though, we still need uh, basic screening for cancer in order to identify identify the patients. So I, I think it's 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 all possible to get there, but it's going to require a concerted effort not just from the private sector, but also from the public sector and all and all stakeholders. I would want to make one reflection, though. You know, I, I I accept that we're not quite at the SDGs, but if you look at a bigger picture, if you look at the last hundred years, it's remarkable what we have accomplished when we have galvanized and and worked as a, as a as a world on these, some of these issues. And if you look at the gains in life expectancy from 30 to 40 years of age 100 years ago to 70 plus in most parts of the world, that's extraordinary. So I believe it's possible. It's going to take, of course, a concerted effort to get to those last 700 million people who need much, much better health care. Thank you very much, Dr. Vass. Mr. Bulcock, can I put the same question to you? What is the role of the private sector? What should it be doing? And you actually, you put that question yourself in your opening statements. What should the private sector be doing? What, it sh what should it not be doing? What is its responsibility in terms of trying to achieve the SDGs? The SDGs, you spoke about the gap, so we have to help to fill the gap. And, 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 and actually, it it's very close to what I just mentioned, creating shared value. I feel the SDGs are a very good framing to align with all the efforts, be it civil society, governments, and private sector, uh, of what the world should be uh, uh, organizing itself for. And if I say my company and, and our basic philosophy is creating shared value, it is to look into where do we intersect with society, where can we um, create that shared value in line with the uh, sustainable development goals. We have integrated completely the sustainable development goals into our uh, reality. We have operal, made, made it operational. So it is in our business principles, our business values, code of conduct. We have um, integrated that in 340,000 people's minds. And, and that in the frame of creating shared value. And we do, and we, we feel the company should define where does, do we intersect better? and more intensively, and for us that uh, definitely it is nutrition and health, nutrition. And that goes then to reformulating products, make them healthier, uh, fortify them. We actually fortify 200 billion products a year, 
uh, with iron, with, with vitamin uh, A, etc. And, and, and do that in a natural way. Um, so uh, this is built into our products, uh, for example. Uh, rural development, I spoke about our supply chain and our commitment to the communities we're working in, and be it uh, cassava in Africa or cocoa or coffee, we have plans there to intensify our collaboration with uh, the rural communities so that they have a better livelihoods. Uh, we have, for example, 1,500 agronomists in our payroll to work with the farmers, and we share quite a lot of best practices there too. So these are all ways of doing it. Environmental sustainability, and, and, and have that, or factories by design, reducing water use, which brings me to water. water so is very so can, can I just interrupt you there, Mr. Borka? The number one SDG is about poverty, isn't it? Making sure that we lift people out of poverty. Now, a number of the people who are at the very bottom of the value chain at Nestle are farmers, right? The people yes. who grow the cocoa and grow the coffee. Um, and they live very wretched lives, many of them. What is the responsibility of a huge MNC like Nestle to try and lift farmers out of poverty? Because they are ultimately no farmers, no chocolate bars, right? What a better example of creating shared value there. We need, and we have factories, where the coffee farmers are, uh, be it in Colombia or be it in Brazil or be it also in Africa. And, and we work with coffee farmers. We have a Nescafe plan. We have also an special AAA plan. Uh, that brings together different elements, which is sharing best practice with the farmers, building up long-term relationships with them, and sharing that uh, best practice so that they uh, have a better understanding of how to do it efficiently. Uh, sharing plantlets, uh, high, um, uh, yielding coffee plantlets uh, that do have a less uh, uh, need for water, for example, um, and working with these people on a long-term basis. They have a better quality of, of our raw materials, so there's a, that is shared value. We need good raw uh, and consistent raw material supply. We work with these farmers to get a better income, a more stable income, and we do that with quite, quite intensively. Uh, I mentioned the agronomists that are working with these people. We have been uh, working with, uh, for example, in Africa alone with, with 60,000 farmers directly. Nestle is connected with 750,000 farmers directly, be it in cocoa, be it in coffee, be it in, in, in milk districts. When we have a factory like in, in the Punjab in India, we have a milk district, 170,000 farmers bringing their milk to our factory on a daily basis. Well, having cooling systems uh, set in place, best practice again. They don't have less losses, better income, more stable, better yields. Um, and so on. And again, that is also a certain interest for us. We need a factory that is supplied. So I feel that that's actually nice examples of, of how the private sector is well served in connecting well with societies they're operating in and stay there in good and bad times, which is very important too. It's not all soft sailing. Um, and, and I started my career in Peru when Shining Path was there. And many companies left. Nestle stayed. We stayed. We still have five factories operating in Venezuela. It's not easy, I can tell you. You see, that, and that's a conviction. And I feel that's where we are a dimension that helps to, to shape with uh, civil society and governments the sustainable development goals. There's a gap to fill, so we have to hurry up. But it's by doing it in the field, in loco that helps. The priority. Post. Mr. Boca, thank you very much. So that concludes the first part of our Global Leaders Investment Summit. We hope you agree that it's been a wide-ranging discussion. Let's show our appreciation for our eminent panelists, Mr. Hamid, Mr. Bakulga, Mr. Jokanovic, Dr. Vaz, and Mr. Borka. Thank you very much indeed.
Gentlemen, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to part two of the Global Leaders Investment Summit. May I request that you take your seats, please? There'll be plenty of opportunities to take selfies and all manner of other video opportunities after the next discussion and debate. Make yourselves comfortable, the show must go on. So, as I said, in order to have a more free flowing discussion, we decided to divide up the Global Leaders Investment Summit, and this is part two. So let me introduce you to the leaders on the stage. We have with us, from the, the far side, His Excellency Samdech Akamoha Senapadei Techo Hun Sen, the Prime Minister of Cambodia, who is attending for the first time. It's a great pleasure to have you with us, Mr. Hun Sen. Sitting beside him is the President of Namibia, His Excellency Mr. Hage Geingob. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Geingob. From the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Vice Prime Minister for Economic Affairs, His Excellency Mr. Kocho Angyushev. CEO of the World Federation of Exchanges, and that is not just stock exchanges, as she will explain to us herself, Ms. Nandini Sukumar. And beside her, we have the CEO of Siemens Financial Services, a very important player in terms of making sure that those big power projects, those big transport systems, get financed and built. Please welcome Mr. Roland Shannon Brown. So our discussion before in the first part ranged across a number of different issues. We looked, we debated whether there has been a backlash to globalization and whether that is the reason why investment has been so disappointing over the last few years and FDI levels have plummeted. And we heard a um, dissenting view from Montenegro saying that actually they had managed to be to, to buck the trend, so some doubt about that. We heard from all our heads of state about the importance of regional energy initiatives, particularly at great length in Mongolia, but in Bangladesh too, and also in um, uh, Montenegro, the importance of regionalism, regional cooperation, and developing regional energy markets. That's something for us to take as a takeaway. We heard from Novartis and Nestle, two of the biggest Swiss companies and companies in the world, how they have woven the SDGs into their core, into their DNA, and in different ways make sure that delivering on the SDGs is an important goal for their businesses. What shall we discuss now? Well, let's start off with Namibia. I would like to ask uh, His Excellency Mr. Hage Geingob, the President of Namibia, to take the floor. Mr. Geingob. Thank you. 
Director of Program, the Secretary General of UNCTAD, who is not here, Your Excellencies, Heads of Government, Madam Moderator, Distinguished Panelists, Ladies and Gentlemen, I wish to express my profound gratitude for the invitation by Secretary General Kitui to participate in this forum. This forum allows us to deliberate on the backlash against globalization stemming from its unequal developmental impact and the risk in rising protectionism. Unfortunately, unilateralism is being promoted through protectionism, placing globalization and multilateralism under siege. There is no doubt that the backlash against globalization is having an effect on international investment and development. According to the 2018 World Investment Report, global foreign direct investment fell by 23% to 1.4 trillion US dollars. In 2017, from 1.8 trillion the previous year. During the same period, foreign direct investment flows to Africa, as well as green field investment, reduced by 21% and 14% respectively. More worrying for developing nations is the fact that number of greenfield investment projects in manufacturing have been consistently lowering during the past five years when compared to the previous five years. The above cited statistics raise a number of questions. Are the declines in investment a consequence of the backlash against globalization? Is it because of the disruptive effect of the dawn of fourth industrial revolution? Or is it a combination of both or other factors at play? Globalization has brought enormous benefits to mankind by providing tremendous opportunity for economic growth, which has improved the quality of life around the world. However, globalization has its own challenges. The greatest challenge for Southern Hemisphere countries is the lack of industrial cap capabilities to the full advantage of the benefits associated with globalization. African countries are even more challenged because of the compounded effect of the advent of fourth industrial revolution that is manifested in characteristics such as 3D printing, the internet things, big data analysis, robotics, cloud computing, computing, and competition between human beings and machines, to name but a few. FDA is critical and remains the largest external source of finance for developing countries and one of the major sources of financing the agenda in 2030. Therefore, a fall in investment would have a negative impact on the realization of the Sustainable Development Goals. The 2018 World Investment Report, the 2018 Trade and Development Report, and 2018 Global Investment trend manager, all confirm that global flows of foreign direct investment fell by 23% in 2018. Growth was near zero in developing economies. It is, for particular, it is of particular concern that in 2017, FDI to Africa was at a 10-year low. Even more worrying, is the finding that the sharp decline in investment was driven by inward-looking policies rather than by the economic cycle. These negative trends in FDI call, viable, call for viable remedies in the investment policy making arena. The time has come for us to decide, do we, do we abandon multilateralism and turn inward abandoning decades of progress, or do we decide to hold hands and pull together for the benefit of humanity? 
As a result of falling FDI, many African governments have turned to international capital markets for, to meet their financing needs, to finance infrastructure and other development needs. More should be done to enhance debt capacity building and technical support for debt sustainability. Policy space is critical for the management of our economies. This is important for the implementation of the SDGs as we strive to cope with globalization. Similarly, countries such as Namibia and others which are classified as upper middle income countries continue to face challenges in mobilizing resources to finance their developmental goals. The World Bank formula of taking the GDP of the country, dividing a small population like that of Namibia, and therefore arriving with high per capita income, and therefore declaring Namibia as rich country, is overlooking the history that the people in Namibia, the Africans, were de denied all the rights. Now, just to take that and say Namibia is rich, and therefore denying us what could be soft loans and grants. For, for globalization to work, it must be inclusive. In this regard, I believe that the United Nations has a crucial role to play in, in, in identifying ways in which more people can benefit from globalization. I have coined an expression, inclusivity spells peace and harmony. Exclusivity spells discord and conflict. I firmly believe that inclusivity is the most fundamental ingredient of policy making. When we exclude certain nations and people feel left out, we create an environment for conflict and discord. In this regard, the United Nations through UNCTAD should ensure that all countries are involved in the process of promoting sustainable development and shared prosperity. Namibia is making a headway in its pursuit of the sustainable development goals, of all which are integrated into our national development plans. We believe in multilateralism. We believe in national, international solidarity, for we are the child of international solidarity, midwife by the United Nations. We are friends to all, enemy to none. We believe that our world can only move forward if we hold hands and pull in the same direction, thereby developing a new growth, new areas of growth. Together, we can bring about sustainable development and shared prosperity for the good of all. I thank you. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, Mr. Geingo. A very coherently argued case there in favour of multilateralism and not turning our collective backs on it. Let's now hear the perspective from Cambodia, which has been a huge beneficiary of FDIs over the last so many decades. We are delighted to have with us His Excellency the Prime Minister, Mr. Hun Sen. Sir, please. The, the podium is yours. Excellencies, Head of State and Government, Excellencies, Madam, Ladies and Gentlemen, today I am very pleased to attend the Global Leaders Investment Summit of the World Investment Forum 2018 to share my vision for our futures. Taking this opportunity, I would like to express my profound thanks to the Secretary General of the UNTAC and Switzerland government for the warm hospitalities extended to me and the Cambodian delegation. I also would like to express my appreciation to your dialogue as well as good recommendations shared in the previous intervention related to investment in the new eras of globalization, which are important for stability and development of each country in the region and the world. 
as Cambodia has contributed to the development of trade and investment under both regional and global framework, I would like to share Cambodia's policies on investment and development as follows. Cambodia fully supports and attached high priorities to the globalization policies, which is upheld by most countries in the globe. But the world is facing many challenges in political, economic, social dimension, as well as migration issues stemming from free geopolitical transformation while protectionism tendencies of some advanced economies is severely affecting the global investment environment and causing slower inflow of foreign direct investment, FDI, to developing countries. Even in such situations, the royal government of Cambodia has continued to adhere to the openness policies, which contributes to high economic growth of around 7% annually during the last two decades. According to UNTAC's report, FDI inflows to Cambodia increased by 12% in 2017, reaching a record level of US dollar 2.8 billion in the area of finance, telecommunication, real estate, and non textile manufacturing sectors, placing Cambodia among the five least developed countries in the world with the highest investment growth. FDI is a crucial financial source for poverty reduction. Poverty rate was reduced from 53% in 2004 to around 13.5% in 2014. Cambodia FDI is regarded as a key factor for the national economic development and the realization of sustainable development goal SDG of the United Nations. Currently, the royal government is developing specific vision and policies to attract more foreign investment by expanding production base, building infrastructures, and improving in transportation system, both soft and hard, reducing electricity costs, promoting trade facilitation, developing human resources, improving information technologies, developing financial sectors, and reforming legal system and regulatory institutions. Indeed, the royal government of Cambodia is, achieving, is actively promoting the implementation of industrial development policy 2015-2025 by focusing on higher value-added production base and greater integration with the regional and global value chain. In addition, the Royal Government of Cambodia is promoting investment in the Special Economic Zone, as is said, with efficient clustering of services. Currently, investors have registered for establishment of 47 SEZ, of which 19 are currently producing and exporting, and 10 are in the process of constructing key physical infrastructures. With investment potential in all areas, protection and investment incentives policies, tech exemption on labor force, big market, as well as other advantage from the relocation of factories from neighboring countries to Cambodia, together with growth of direct investment flow from major economies such as China, Japan, and South Korea, make Cambodia is expected to realize higher growth of FDI inflows. Excellencies, Madam, ladies and gentlemen, in terms of economic, economic liberalization under the global framework, Cambodia is playing an active role in coordinating and pushing 
World Trade Organization members' countries to provide tariff and non-quotas exemption, facilitate on the rule of origins, issues exemption in service sectors, supply more technical assistance to less developed countries, as well as renew any measures which are not favorable to the global investment and trade. Unfortunately, as you are aware, of, the world is currently facing a severe trade war that may extend for a longer period as some developed countries have taken protectionism policies and unilateral Lism stance affecting the interests of most of the countries that support globalization. This leads to the stagnation of the trade negotiation under the WTO framework due to the uncertainty of next tech policies as well as the pressure and sanction which seriously affect trade, investment and export from least developed countries to international market as well as create barriers to the implementation of the UN 2030 agenda. Globalization is the global trend that promotes economic growth, reduce poverty, and improve livelihood of the people. Meanwhile, Movement against globalization is also taking place due to the growing imbalance of income and widening of inequality gap, which are causing countries to lose their mutual trust and fear globalization. Based on this, I would like to call on all leaders to express their goodwill with high responsibilities responding to the global challenge in order to maintain investment climate, geopolitical stability, as well as to build trust in financial and industrial sectors. As one of the UN members with high responsibilities, Cambodia is ready to work with relevant stakeholders to safeguard free and fair trade system, maintain regional and global peace, security and stability. At the same time, I would like to invite leaders the companies to join us as investment partners to contribute to the development of Cambodia and global growth. On behalf of the Royal Government of Cambodia, I assure all investors of favorable condition and support for investment in Cambodia, particularly by ensuring peace, security and political stability, as well as macroeconomic stabilities and legal and institutional framework with efficiencies, transparencies and accountability. Furthermore, I fully support all international policies promoting regional and global investment and call on development partners to provide technical assistance to least developed countries in order to support the effective formulation and the effective implementation growth-oriented policies. Finally, I would like to once again thank Excellency Secretary General of ANTAT for organizing the World Investment Forum 2018 and providing the opportunities for Cambodia and other least developed countries to demonstrate their investment potential and to share our recommendation for the discussion on sustainable development under the global framework. I strongly hope that this forum will play a greater role in promoting further investment 
and wish Excellencies, Madam, ladies and gentlemen, good health and success in every endeavor. Thank you so much, Your Excellency. So a strong restatement there of Cambodia's commitment to openness and stability and continued efforts to develop um, legal frameworks, energy systems and regional networks to make it continue to be a magnet for FDI. Um, let's get a Southern European perspective now. I'm pleased to introduce you to the Vice Prime Minister from Macedo former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, Mr. Kocho Angushev, Ms. Angushev. Distinguished Secretary General of UNTAC, Mr. Kitai, distinguished panelists, your excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the uh, Government of Republic of Macedonia, in capacity as Deputy Prime Minister in charge of economic affairs, I would like to express my satisfaction with the possibility to represent my country on this World Investment Forum. Because we are discussing about investment, I want to mention and underline a few very important things for any, especially small countries like our country, Macedonia. The first uh, in, the role, in, in, the, in the line of the most important things for any investor in any country, of sh sure, is the rule of law. I discuss in my capacity, like Deputy Prime Minister responsible for economy, with a lot of direct foreign investors in our country. Of course, all of us, we are thinking that for them it's important to obtain some incentive, some subvention by the government, but it's not in the first line. In the first line always is rule of law and stability in the country. On the third position is some subvention or incentive, what is also very important for any country. I want to say a few words for all of those important items for my country. For rule of law and for stability of the politics and stability of the country generally saying, for small country means to be part of the bigger security system. Because Macedonia is in the center, in the heart of the Balkan Peninsula, in the Europe, to means to be part of European Union and NATO integrations. Our country did a lot of and significant steps to improving relations with all neighboring countries, what is the first and very important step to be part of this European Union and NATO initiatives and to be a member of those two institutions. I think that now we are on the good way and this will encourage all investors in the world to come in Macedonia and to find and to uh, recognize Macedonia like good investor destina investment destination. For this reason, I think that also the first step we already did, we developed the very transparent law for financing of investment. That means supporting all investors to come in Macedonia. This program is very transparent according to rules. That means it's not negotiate, negotiation with any particular investor, but if the investors satisfy some rules and satisfy some criteria, they will have the very high level of predictability that will be supported by the government. They can return their money for, investor, for investment. They can be a part of the free custom zone where they have possibility to uh, be sure that for the next 10 years they will have 0% uh, of the corporate tax and 0% of the personal taxes. And they can have the significant impact of the domestic economy. I want to underline the last one, because uh, having direct foreign investment in the country without significant impact of the domestic economy doesn't mean a lot. Because in this case, you have a raising of the numbers, but you have no any impact or significant impact of domestic economy, what is very important. If we want to grow economy in small country like Macedonia, it can be based 
on several main points or the several, several pillars. First of all, it's industry. If, of course, if you are not a country with very uh, with big national resources, and unfortunately, Macedonia uh, have not, has not a lot of uh, national resources, that means that uh, we have no oil, no gas. That means that we can uh, <coughs> make our and uh, develop our economy on the several another pillars. It is industry, agrar, trading, and construction. In industry, if you want to discuss about the big industrial capacity in the small country with the small market like Macedonia, two million people, you have to discuss about export-orientated industry. To be export-orientated industry means to have possibility to have a, uh, a, approach to the high-level technologies and know-how. This is exactly what we are trying to do, and for this reason we developed this uh, law for support of investment or financial support for all investors, doesn't matter they are domestic or international. This program is very important and fortunately it's very successful and only this year with destabilization in the country in relation with the neighboring countries and moving up in the process of enjoying a Euro, a European Union and NATO and with this transparent program in free custom zones and also all over the country, we have triple direct foreign investment in the first half of 2018 in comparison with 2017 or the higher level of direct foreign investor is investment in the comparison of previous six, seven years. Also, it's a lot of investors discussing in this moment to come in Macedonia, and I'm using this opportunity to invite all investors to recognize our country like very interesting uh, for investment. Why? Because we are close to the European market, which is big market. We have very well-educated young people, and I think that we have all possibilities uh, like support and uh, uh, like incentive for investors, but also stability in the country and uh, also high level of the rule of law. That means that any investor can be, can, can be uh, sure that his capital is protected in our country. I can share a few numbers only, that uh, we have 6% increasing of uh, industrial production uh, this half of the year, first half of the 2018 in comparison with the same period previous year. We have 14% increasing of export, 7% increasing of the salary in the country, and 3.1% growing of GDP in the second quarter in comparison with the second quarter previous year. These numbers are very encouraging for uh, us, like the government, to keep, on our, to, to keep our politics on the right way and to go in this direction how I discussed previously. The government, it's not, some, it's not institution which will interfere in the real business. Governmental job is to decrease, to, sorry, to increase the capacity of infrastructure in the country. This is the reason why we are very committed to increasing infrastructure in our country, especially in Corridor 8 and Corridor 10, what means not a lot for the rest of the world, maybe regionally means a lot, but that means that uh, we have to decrease our connection with the highways and railways with the neighboring countries in the Balkan Peninsula and to secure fast and secure transport of the people and goods from our country to the rest of the world, especially to the Europe. Through the port in Thessaloniki, which is very close to our country and uh, in Greece and with the increasing the relationships with uh, our neighboring countries, especially with Greece, we have the good approach to the sea transportation and to deliver the goods all over the world. On the end of the day, I want to repeat once again that I'm using this opportunity to inform you about all these activities in our country and to invite all potential investors to recognize our country like uh, the good destination for investment. 
We, like the government, we will be committed for any particular investor. We can organize one shop stop for all of them, and I hope that we will, they will be satisfied. The previous few years, we have a lot of investors from developed country, and I can share information with you that they are very satisfied, and they are, all of them, they grow their businesses uh, in our country, but also in their network all over the world. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I will be on your disposal for any question later on during this panel. Thanks a lot. So thank you very much, Mr. Angushev. A nice advertisement there of the attractions of investing in the former Yugoslav Republic of uh, Macedonia. I was very interested in your point that the number one thing, the number one factor that pulls in FDI is the rule of law. And that's far more important, in your opinion, than financial incentives, tax incentives, and all the rest of it. That's a, an intriguing point. OK, now let me introduce you to the other woman on the stage alongside with me, the other Indian woman on the stage alongside me, Nandini Sukumar, who is the um, CEO of the World Federation of Exchanges. What is the role of exchanges, stock exchanges and commodities exchanges and derivatives exchanges in facilitating FDI, Nandini? Nisha, thank you um, for that introduction and what a pleasure to be here with all of you. Thank you, James. Um, and uh, the World Investment Forum for having us here. It's an important point, and I think the question you ask is very key to our mandate and how we see and what we see as the exchange role in financial development. Um, we are the industry, I represent the industry exchanges and CCPs. Uh, we're the global trade group, and we represent about 200 market infrastructures around the world. So we, our members run... Uh, the structures that facilitate uh, trade and investment into the financial system. Now, exchanges and CCPs in general have, are inherently in two key aspects uh, of the financial system. One is the growth uh, agenda, as we call it, and two, stability and systemic resilience. And it is from both these perspectives that I will now uh, wish to address my remarks today. In general, to put, some, to put some thoughts into context, uh, WFE exchanges are home to nearly 45,000 listed companies, and the market capitalization of these entities is over 82.5 trillion US dollars. Uh, around 82 trillion US in trading annually passes again through the infrastructures that our members safeguard. So our members really do sit uh, at the very junction of the political, financial, and the real economy. Um, and so that in essentially is our mandate. Well-functioning exchanges enable growth and development by facilitating the mobilization of financial resources. They bring together those who need capital to innovate and grow with those that have resource uh, to invest. Now, there are four things I want us all to think about today. I've chosen four out of a list of thousands potentially, uh, but four priorities really I would like all of us in this room who represent the ecosystem to think about. The first of which is um, the international investment in emerging markets. How do we foster it, um, both as market infrastructures and those of us sitting on this panel today? The second uh, follows very closely um, from Vice Prime Minister's uh, remarks about the rule of law. Uh, I want us, I invite us all to think a little bit about regulation, specifically regulation, regulatory coherence and dissonance, um, and how and what that factor is that plays out when we think about investment investment uh, in emerging markets and indeed all markets. I want, to think, I want us to think a little bit about cybersecurity. It is absolutely an issue of our times. And finally, um, about risk and how it's come out of the financial system um, in the wake especially of the G20 mandate. We are all sitting in this room today 10 years, uh, around the decade after the Lehman crisis, uh, and it is very appropriate that in thinking about the growth agenda, we should also reflect um, on systemic issues. 
So now turning briefly to each of those points, uh, with terms of international investment in emerging markets, International investors are critical to the growth and development of domestic capital markets. They provide liquidity, enhanced price transparency, and price discovery. This enhances the attractiveness of domestic markets and the use thereof by local entrepreneurs. This creates, again, a virtuous cycle that flows through to the real economy and benefits everyone. While domestic returns matter for international investment, what is also critically important is the existence of an enabling policy environment and, as our upcoming research suggests, company adherence to corporate governance standards. Both exchanges and regulators, therefore, have an important role to play in this regard. Second, regulatory dissonance or coherence. And this is, again, uh, a statement of our times. As a generation, we've pulled towards global financial markets and aspired to global harmonization of regulation. This facilitates cross-border investment flows with the positive benefits that I have just set out. Regulated financial markets are the bedrock of investment, and without them, sustainable development is just not possible. But the pendulum is swinging back. We are at a time of regionalism and of greater nationalism, which may undermine the very important role of market-based financing. While recognizing national regulatory priorities, we need to be cautious of undoing the progress that has been made. So given regulatory coherence enables markets-based financing and greater investment, how do we navigate? Turning now to cybersecurity, this is the risk of our decade. As technology has enabled and enhanced our lives, it has also brought with it its own attendant risks. Cyber resilience is an issue that every organization thinks about. It is a global issue. It requires global cooperation and coordination. At the WFE, for example, as part of the industry's front line of defense, we gather a group of chief information security officers together to share information and best practice and work together to resolve any concerns or issues. It, cyber is truly a global issue, and uh, it, will, it impacts all our lives. And turning now to systemic risk, a decade on from the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, the G20 meets in Argentina at the end of November, the G20 mandate lowered risk in markets, it cut risk in markets. It brought, by mandate, vast quantities of financial products that existed in the over-the-counter market into a more transparent world, that of the exchange and the central counterparty world. So, as we think about the risks and the resilience of globally interconnected markets, what do we need to think about and plan for in the, now, in the next decade? And finally, I want to mention UNCTAD Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative. This is a key milestone as we work collectively towards the SDGs. We will meet this afternoon to discuss how we can move together towards our shared goals. Tomorrow, the WFE and UNCTAD host a session, to which you're all welcome, uh, where we think about sustainability and commodity derivatives. All these issues affect the global development agenda. The public policy solutions we seek and find will define growth and prosperity in the coming years, so we must think about them. Thank you, Nandini. So there's your answer, the role of exchanges in directing, channeling, and funneling FDI into frontier markets. Now, the man with the money on the stage is Roland Shalom Brown, who um, is CEO of Siemens Financial Services. I didn't even know Siemens had a financial services arm, but I discovered it is massive. So what is it that you provide, Roland? So basically loans to big, to big infrastructure projects? Money. Tell us about it. Money. Yes, and money. <laughs> no. No, but thank you very much for the privilege of being here. And, and um, Siemens has a, a very proud 170-year uh, history, and we consider ourselves to be a true global citizen. We have over 150... 350,000 employees. We have manufacturing facilities and are represented in over 200 countries. Our, our beginning started with con constructing the telegraph pole for the line from London to um, St. Petersburg. And um, <clears throat> so we really consider ourselves a global citizen. Um, 
As such, I think globalization has had a lot of very positive impacts, but unfortunately the benefits have not been shared equally. And I think one of the res responsibilities of many of us who sit here is to really focus on that and try and do whatever is possible to ensure that the benefits of globalization are more equitably di distributed. Um, and in parallel, the growing protectionism and in certain pockets, the growing nationalism um, is something that does concern us and we are, having, we are seeing negative impacts. Um, just the trade escalations between China and um, the U.S. We manufacture in China for export to the U.S. We manufacture in the U.S. to export to China. Um, increasing tariffs on increase the costs, and the costs then get reflected and get passed through to the end consumer. So it, it's a negative for everybody. But as a global, global citizen, we are very much concerned and committed to the SGDs, and not only in terms of our product and service portfolios, by providing reliable and affordable energy, by investing in smart and livable cities, and also in innovative healthcare systems. But also we remain committed to our goal for 2030 of being carbon neutral and ensuring that, um, setting an example, that worldwide all our manufacturing facilities on a combined basis are carbon neutral. Because I think it's important that also companies like ourselves um, set an example and also take a pioneering role in um, ensuring that um, in, in the battle against um, global warming effectively and, um, and, and the, those types of transitions. But just focusing back on the, um, on the, on the impacts of globalization, um, the growing protectionism, and I think I can't help think that that also contributes to some of the migration issues that we are seeing. Naturally, a lot of people are um, trying to flee from conflict and so on, but I think it's also reflective of the growing lack of opportunity that they see in many of their countries. And so one of the key focuses of Siemens is really to, to also invest in those countries and to try and improve the not only the economic environment in those countries, but also to, to try and generate a future that makes it more attractive in, in, in those countries. And that's effectively what we do as the financial services arm um, of Siemens. Um, we focus very much on trying to ensure that there is an, an attractive investment environment in most, in most developing countries for FDIC. Um, we talked about the rule of law and so on. I think that has to go beyond just the rule of law, but also in the enforceability of contractual rights and things like that. Um, and to provide sort of transparency in the RFP processes, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we also need to make sure that we have a contractual structures that embed a minimum number of, um, of standards, including human rights, um, exploitation of people, um, a commitment to employ health and safety and various, various environmental safeguards and so on. And as I reflect, not all of those activities are being actively absor observed in many investments that we are seeing around the world. Um, maybe I can just take one minute just to illustrate uh, what we have been doing. Um, and this is, we partnered with the Egyptian government and the Department of Energy there to really try and, and, and improve the energy reliability of um, in Egypt. And we successfully managed to boost energy's power generation capacity by 45%, um, adding 14.4 gigawatts to the, um, to the national grid and supply 45 million Egyptians with reliable electricity. electricity. Um, but in these large projects, it's not just the technical challenges that we have. We also trained over 600 technicians and engineers, both locally and, and back at home again, to manage these activities and so on. And together with our partners in these various projects, we've actually generated 24,000 good jobs in Egypt that allow people to actually um, uh, effectively have, have families and afford families and a very good lifestyle on those things. So I think that's another contribution that we are making very significantly. But underpinning um, all these large projects is of course arranging the financing and that is not, not easy and increasingly with the growing uncertainty um, one has to really focus on the underlying business case behind foreign direct investment and the investments. In this case, we really partnered with many international partners, with export credit agencies, um, and ensured that the contractual framework was sufficiently attractive and bankable 
that we could, in this case, attract 17 large multinational banks into the debt facility that then helped to arrange the debt. And I think the financing is actually a key element on that. And so addressing this topic, I think one of the most important things is making impactful solutions. And I think for multinationals such as Siemens, together with some um, attendant financing, can really help and um, counteract some of the negative trends that we are seeing and the backlashes from globalization. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sean O'Brien. So contractual rights, transparency, also absolutely essential in addition to the rule of law. And uh, I do want to ask you more about whether we're seeing fewer bankable projects actually make the grade in the uncertain investment climate at the moment. But we'll save that question. Um, I'd like to start our free-flowing discussion around the issue of regional enhancement and regionalism, because I heard that word pop up from time to time in all the comments that were made from the, from the stage this morning. And um, if I may, I'd like to start with uh, His Excellency, the Prime Minister of Cambodia, Mr. Hun Sen. Um, so you stress the importance of regional FDI clusters. Uh, in terms of your, your own Cambodian development prospects and the region as a whole. Can you tell us a bit more about Cambodia's policy so far as regional integration is concerned? Uh, thank so you for the question. Uh, As uh, the time constraint, I can uh, sum up that in order to attract investment to my country, uh, in short, uh, all my experience is the trust. Trust is the foremost important issue. We start from trust on peace, political stability, no investor will go to invest in our country under the bullet, in the, the shelling, under insta political instability. That's a point which requires, first of all, it's prerequisite. It's experience today as in the past and in the future. They have to set up the trust from investors, from foreign investors, that they are invest in our country. Another point that we have been successful in attracting investment as well as integrating through investment is open economy with discipline. Or I mean that a rich related open economy for Cambodia, I can stress that there is no discrimination between domestic or foreign investors. In some countries, the investor cannot invest 100% in some sectors. But for Cambodia, we allow foreign investors to invest 100% by themselves without requiring to have partners uh, from the local invest investor. In addition to that, the royal government, as well as the private sectors, must have mutual to trust through a norm which is called discipline. But the part of the royal government should not pressure or betray uh, not to uh, observe any promise given to the private sector. And the private sectors, they had to respect the norm that agree upon, let's say, paying the tax, for example, or implement the promise of investment. Along with that, market is also very important in order to attract investment to our country. We cannot invest just for domestic market, not just for consumption of the 16 million population of Cambodia, but investment in our country would be, we have access to the other market, then that is the success. And I think the time is coming. Thank you. And hope that my response uh, could be an input for you. Thank you.
Thank you very much, sir. It was certainly a timely intervention, and you must never feel the pressure of time. It was good to hear from you. Um, I'd like to ask um, Mr. Geingo about some regional um, dimensions, if I may. You, you may. you mentioned in your opening statement about the potential negative impact of climate change on Namibia. Well, the importance of investment in, in water, in energy infrastructure. Can you tell us a bit more about what the Namibian government is doing and, and do you see a regional dimension as part of the solution? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, as a former teacher, I was trying to answer questions when I was making my speech and also to adhere to time. So I didn't go into Namibia's specific aspects. Uh, regional, coordinate, regional integration in Africa is based on our RECs. We have SATEC, we have ECOWAS, we have East African community. These RECs are meant to coordinate, harmonize our governance architecture. Because governance, as I mentioned with the law, is a key that Africa is now having good governance, so to say. We are elected, we have term limits, and therefore with that we have to harmonize also regionally that we have same policies. So in SATEC, where I come from, for instance, we are coordinating everything. It is true climate change is a serious problem for us in Namibia, in Botswana. These are dry countries, and therefore water is a problem. Energy is also a problem. So if we are looking at energy mix, the hydro, maybe the uh, uh, solar and wind, these are all open fields for any investor to come. Because Namibia is, is good sun throughout the year and also wind. So energy is a problem. Climate change is a problem to us, a serious problem. The good governance that we have in South Africa now, macroeconomic fundamentals, but we have socioeconomic problems that our people have been divided, some left out. So the basic thing is to address the poverty and corruption. That's what we are addressing in Namibia. So therefore, if we have a good investment climate, we will of course invite the investors to come. The Greenfield investment is there. And as I said, energy, we have hydro, we have wind and solar. So Namibia is ready to invite the investors. We have peace, we have good governance. I didn't talk about that. That's what Africa is now standing for. So that's new Africa. So you can come to Namibia, you can come to any part of Southern Africa and Africa and meet the conditions that are conducive to investment. Thank you very much, Mr. Gaingo. And can I put that sort of regional type of question to you too, um, Mr. Angyushev? How do you make sure that it, when the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia is trying to make itself more attractive to uh, investment and openness, and, and you've been very successful, that you don't detract from the region? Mm -hmm. that you support your neighbors. How does it become a win-win rather than a kind of, oh, I want it, but not you, if you get what I'm saying? Regional cooperation is crucial for uh, our country, but uh, also for the whole region, not only for our country. In the previous panel was uh, Mr. Djukanovic, the president of the Montenegro. And, uh, you know, in uh, our region, it's a lot of uh, different countries, but small countries. Uh, all of them uh, themselves are not uh, enough attractive markets for any direct foreign investors. That means that uh, we have to be open countries to cooperate between us, because if we can increase regional uh, cooperation regionally, in this case, uh, we can easily cooperate with European Union or the rest of the world. First of all, we have to increase our regional cooperation. One part of the countries, let's say Montenegro, Bosnia, Serbia, Macedonia, 
also Croatia now is the part of European Union, Slovenia is the part of European Union. All of those countries was the part, the, the ex-republics uh, in ex-Yugoslavia. Mm. And uh, even in that time, they, they cooperate more than today, what is said. And I think that we have the most space for increased de this cooperation. I can tell you only one example. Doesn't make any sense to spend half billion euro to increase highway to speed up transportation of the goods, let's mean trucks or something, for 20 minutes through the country. After that, if the truck wait 10 hours on the border for custom procedures, that doesn't make any sense. And uh, I think that we have here a lot of space for improving the procedure for, uh, for it is uh, uh, administra administrative barriers and uh, I can say uh, uh, custom so, barriers. So sorry to interrupt you there, but you told us earlier in your opening remarks that you, a big infrastructure program, road transport, is underway at the moment. Yes. Right? To, so that money is going there, you've raised the money, but what about the borders then? This is the reason why I uh, mentioned this question, because without solving these issues, investment doesn't work. And for this reason, uh, we are uh, now on the good way in the whole region, inside in the Berlin process. This process was announced by the Chancellor, uh, by the, uh, Angela Merkel, the Chancellor, Chancellor of the Germany. And uh, she, uh, in the frame of European Union, she uh, developed this program for the region. And uh, you know that this is the uh, West Balkan six countries. And I think that through this program and throw the all additional alternatives uh, in, uh, and additional ideas and programs in the region, we will avoid these uh, uh, obstacles. And uh, I'm very, and I'm quite sure that uh, we have very good future. First of all, cooperating regionally in the, in the, in the region, and after that, whole region to cooperate with the rest, rest of the world. Exactly tomorrow, from uh, Geneva, I'm traveling to Podgorica, where we have the, this uh, West uh, Balkan six countries uh, summit, and we have uh, every six months this frame of the summit where we are trying to improve all these procedures. And I'm quite sure that results will come, and the first results we are already seeing in our cooperation. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Anguship. So, Nandani Sukumar, one of the four things you asked us all to consider at the beginning was the way in which we're, we're seeing an upsurge in regionalism, see, regionalism and greater nationalism, right? And I was intrigued that you mentioned that. What is the impact on exchanges? How is it manifesting itself? And what can we do to try and protect and, and bolster cooperation if there is this increase? So I think an important starting point here is as industry, um, and both of us to the left of the table represent industry as opposed to national government, um, is that we are not political organizations. So in essence, we must all learn and live with the consequences of political decision making. So it is not for us uh, to comment on the political decision making, but rather to navigate the consequences of that. So if you're an exchange or a central counterparty, um, you, every day, you know, you are having to think about the future and you're having to think about how you facilitate the smooth flow of capital through regulated markets. And if, that mar if, if those structures around you are changing, that doesn't change your job. You still have to go ahead. So really, what we would like to say to everyone in this room, and indeed what we say consistently to regulators and to our stakeholders, is that the world does need greater regulatory dialogue and does need to have, uh, we need to pull towards regulatory harmonization where at least markets um, have coordinated responses or thinking, uh, even while we cannot control the politics that guide the decisions. Okay, thank you. Punchy answer. So Raymond Shalom I'm not going to ask you a question about regionalism. Uh, I want to ask you about what you were saying about bankable projects. That is the key thing that you need um, to, to, to decide whether to invest. And has that become more difficult to actually meet those criteria, given that we're seeing this very uncertain financial climate in 2018? Um, 
currency outflows, etc. I would say yes. Can I just ask you an earlier question? What does Siemens Financial Services actually do? Mm. Given our commitment to many developing countries to actually investing in those countries, one of our key goals is also to really partner with our industrial colleagues to actually facilitate investment in those um, countries, either through equity investments, project finance, or various vendor financing programs. But to address um, the comment, the question you just made, and, and I think um, it's a very good one. I personally see that there is growing uncertainty and, and, and um, investor skepticism, and I think um, it is actually growing. Secondly, I think infrastructure projects are very long-term, often complicated projects with unclear business cases, um, and that makes it a, a challenge. But I think one of the biggest issues is, you know, there's, we have this dichotomy. We see there's such a tremendous pent-up need for investment in infrastructure. On the other hand, we see there's so much liquidity in the marketplace. The point is that liquidity is very much in the hands of different constituencies than we saw in the past. It's pension comes, insurance companies, um, and in various fund structures. And they are largely liability-driven investors looking for duration matches for the long-term liabilities. Um, but given their fiduciary responsibilities um, to the pensioners or the, whoever invests money with them, also, they are limited in taking certain risks, and they can't necessarily take construction risk, merchant risk, or ridership risks, availability-based payments, and then there's, so there's a reluctance to do that. They're willing to come in after a project is completed, and you have one or two years of um, performance data that really says this is a stable product project and we can so in, the, invest So in. the pool of money is not as big as we think it is? Well, it, it, it is there, but, but it, it's in other people's hands. And I think the fund structure look also for a disciplined investment environment and also a clear exit. Many, many funds have a 10-year investment horizon and then want an exit, for example. That's not necessarily conducive to a 12 or 15-year um, in infrastructure financing and so on. So it, it, it is real key. And then thirdly, the topic that we've all been addressing is having a, um, a contractual env environment that conforms to certain no norms as a legal environment, a certain level of transparency, um, etc., is not necessarily improving very significantly. And I think this growing protectionism and some of the backlash to globalization is actually leading to a... a um, a, less, a more translucent environment more rather than a transparent environment. And I think those three things all take into account, given the globalization and some of the concerns are, are actually making it more difficult to mobilize funds for inf regional infrastructure, particularly in, um, in emerging markets. The other last, the last point I'd add to that is it, it's, it's not really viable to allow expect governments to be able to fund these projects. I think there has to be a clear focus on public-private partnerships, because otherwise this will not be, be possible, for example. And um, so I think we're also seeing an improvement in the availability and the willingness to look at public-private partnerships with maybe different forms of risk, risk sharing and reward sharing over the life of a project and so on. But these developments are, um, are dragging on. So it's quite a challenging environment. So picking up on one of the points that we just heard from Mr. Chalon Brown, that the efforts to continue the investment openness, the attractiveness of countries is, is also not moving ahead as it should. Uh, I'd like to ask um, His Excellency Mr. Hun Sen to share with us what's going on in Cambodia, because um, Cambodia has been very successful, as we know, in attracting FDIs, and it seems to be... Um, committed to continuing that process to keep up the openness, to keep up the investment facilitation. Um, can you tell us a bit more about what you're doing to make yourself even more attractive? Because uh, it's very easy to say, yeah, we've done it, we're there, you know, everyone knows the case to invest in, in Cambodia. How do, you make your, how do you improve it from, from where you've got to at this point? What are the key elements you're doing? <laughs> Thank you for the additional question. Uh, my work still continues, first of all, to guarantee political stability and macroeconomic stability. That's the special point to attract investment, because I still speak insistently that no one will invest in our country when there is no peace, real peace in that country. 
And if we cannot uh, manage the inflation, cannot guarantee macroeconomic stability, that would uh, lost the trust from the investor. That the investor could leave Cambodia. At the same time, I would like to stress that we need to try to maintain, to keep the old investors in our country so that they continue to invest and expand the investment in our country. In addition to that, we attract new investors. It's true that there are some countries, they talk that trade war between America and China will become the opportunity for other countries like Cambodia. Which, which the flow from uh, investor from China to Cambodia and to other countries. But to me, I don't want that to happen. I met the uh, U.S. Business Council and I told them that whether it's uh, easy to attract the factories from China to other countries, in the Trump administration, and later the administration of others, they had to cooperate with China. Then they need to move back the factory to China. So uh, that this Cambodian uh, strategy to attract investment is one plus. Let's say, for example, the invest of the European country or Japan or America in Thailand, in other countries in ASEAN, they can expand their branch to Cambodia. That is important part. And it will not lose the investor in Thailand or in Vietnam or in Malaysia. But they increase, set up the relation of investment to Cambodia. That is uh, one of the strategy among the many for attract investment. Thank you. Um, former Yugoslav um, Republic of Macedonia, I think, is there a message you want to send? Ah, Vice Minister, I and Prime Minister, I understand you have to be whisked away. Do we give permission to the Vice Prime Minister to leave? We are very delighted that you were able to join us, Mr. Arm Thank you very much. I was about to put the next question to you, so it's just as well you came and got me at that point. Um, so. You know, we started off talking about the Sustainable Development Goals at the very beginning of this morning when um, Dr. Kituyu made his opening address. And Dr. Kituyu is going to bring our session to an end at the end, but I would like us to return to the Sustainable Development Goals and chew over them, really, in, in turn. And if, if I could call on Mr. Geingob um, from, from Namibia, can you talk to us about how you see the empowerment of young people, the empowerment of growth um, in jobs for young people, and how foreign investors can help with that? Because that's a really vital part of the SDGs, is it not? Yes, the empowerment of the youth and the women is the key. And I think in Namibia, we, are, we have done a great job. Uh, youth are empowered through politics because politics determines everything, who gets what and how. So you first have to empower them at a political level. And then women also, we have already 50-50 when it comes to party structures. And even our parliament is now already about 47% of women. So very soon we have to empower them. Give people first political power because that's what they decide. And then secondly, economic empowerment. Investors, uh, this day is really, it's a funny situation that we have to look at China now and talk about China, maybe we're going to come to that, I don't know. But Africa, Namibia was a commodity-based uh, country. When commodity prices are now down, you are stuck. And also investors are not coming because we have good governance, so we realize they were coming for commodities. While war was going on in Angola, American companies were there invested in oil. So commodities, 
And when those prices go down like uranium in my country, then in other countries, you, all of them have stopped. But China came and set up our biggest investment ever, which I regard as investment in uranium, because they need it in their country. And by so doing a great job, empowering youth and so on. Again, infrastructure development in Africa. Infrastructure. If you look at roads and airports that are being built, are coming from, somebody said earlier, from China. And then we were told that we we're going to be recolonized by China again. And we said we should be respected a little bit because we are grown up, we fought for our own countries. We're not going to exchange one colonialism for another one. But what Chinese taught us is that whoever comes to our country must come on our own terms. That's what they say, those who go to China go on their terms. So I tell Chinese, I will tell anybody, come and invest in Namibia. Namibia is ready, but you must now come on our own terms. So youth empowerment, youth is the future. So give them political power, economic power. But whoever comes, I mean, we have a democracy, we have good macroeconomic uh, fundamentals. Our banking system is about 14th in the world. So come and invest, but come on our terms. We must decide in which areas we must invest. Uh, invest. Not you deciding, as in the past. So youth is the future, and women, actually. And Denise Kumar? Youth empowerment, access of energy to all, poverty reduction, good health, the, the whole range of SDGs. Is there a direct link between the growth of markets and exchanges and the delivery of the SDGs? Or is that a sort of second tier benefit that might come about? What is the link? No, absolutely, there is a link between the role of the exchange and CCP and the growth of the nation. And part of, I think, if anything, part of what we're trying to do is have more discourse in the industry around what that link is. So UMTAD and the WFE actually wrote a paper together. We, we did a piece of research together last year, which we published, and in, in which we looked actually directly at the role of the exchange, the role of the stock exchange, in the growth agenda. More broadly, if we go back to the Sustainable Stock Exchange Initiative, um, which is, again, an, an UNCTAD uh, initiative that the World Federation of Exchanges is very involved with, there are four, there are four particular uh, goals, that four relevant goals that stock exchanges are best positioned to support. And they are gender equality, sustainability information, climate change, and global partnerships. So both directly and you know, in the specifics of the SDGs, there is a link. Okay, succinctly put. And I'm going to put the same question to you, Raymond Shonnell Brown. You were telling us earlier about how difficult it is, increasingly difficult it is for projects, long-term infrastructure problem projects, to meet the, the bankable mm -hmm. um, criteria, the bar. And then on top of that, if you load SDG goals, does that not make it more difficult? Or is it vital that SDG goals are woven into these infrastructure projects? Tell us honestly. I think, I think they're actually woven, woven into it. But the key case is to make um, infrastructure investments and structures around it actually bankable. And, and, and it sounds quite an easy statement to make, but it's actually very easy. And I, we, I see a lot of investments in big infrastructure projects, port facilities, et cetera, where the business case is, is, is very elusive and then there is no real off-taker for these projects, for example, and so on. And then depending who the primary investor is, um, they may have different flexibility in, in terms of executing security over that and so on. So I think bankable and good business cases is, is very, very key, not just for the project itself, but over the life of even beyond the project, for example. I think what else can be done is that I think host countries could involve development banks, international financial institutions, etc., cetera, um, to assist in setting up workable frameworks and acting as a catalyst to attract um, commercial lending and export credit agencies. A lot of work is being done on that, but I think we can really focus on that and really add much more. And I think the third bit is just more transparency, not only in the RFP process, um, but only, particularly in the early stages of a project's lifestyle to attract investors. And um, you know, you are seeing the applicable of different standards. Um, 
not to raise any dispersions, but sometimes there are certain projects under the BRI initiative that perhaps have different characteristics and so on than the ones that we as, a, as, as Siemens would look for, for example. So I think having efficient, transparent, and a fair competitive environment is actually key, and I think that will help to mobilize and bridge the gap between, um, between the tremendous need for investment and um, mobilizing funds to actually achieve that. Thanks, Mr. Sean O'Brien. So, Dr. Kituyu, you got us started with our opening address. I wonder if I can invite you to gather your thoughts together and send us forthwith. Um, well, what have you heard that struck with you? Why, why not? Go, go, go to the podium. What, would you like to what thoughts would you like to leave us with? Okay, thank you very much. Um, it has been very enriching listening to world leaders from the corporate and political sectors share with us the sense and our challenge dealing with globalization, the imperatives of sustainable development, the challenges and how to read a new meaning into regionalism. Let me give my five cent worth of opinion and then try to round off this session. First of all, a clear understanding of the dynamics of globalization challenges today is important for prescribing what to do. Globalization is not wrong, but a globalization that was surrendered to deregulation created wealth and inequality in equal measure. Identifying how to build in, cushion in the vulnerable will be critical for making globalization sustainable. It is cheap, I think, the way politically the world has found easy explanations of anti-globalization, often attributed to the rise of populism on the political right. But look at the political reality of the world today. The rise of economic nationalism, the notion that solutions are through disengaging from the world, are to be found both on the left and on the right of the mainstream politics. It's not accidental that in Italy, the coalition of the Five Star, the coalition government has populists from the left and the right. In Britain, Corbyn of the Labour Party comes from the same page as the rightists in the debate on Brexit. In the US, many of Sanders' Democrats migrated to vote with Trump instead of Hillary. So the message of nationalism as if in the face of fear of a diminishing middle class because of globalization is not tagged to extreme right as has been popular in rhetoric. That's one. A second phenomenon we have to understand is a lot of the reason fear of global value chains has been informed by an incipient competition, almost scramble on the frontier of technology. If you look at the three main players, when Germany came up with the Industry 4.0, how to embrace a read, new defined retool policy on the digital economy, China's industrial strategy 2025 appears very clearly a response to the German strategy. And to many of us, America first is an industrial policy response to the China strategy 2025. If you look at the last 20 years, you see a very interesting phenomenon. 1998, the U.S. under Clinton declared China as a strategic partner and saw the liberative power of capitalism, of free market economy, as a way of bringing it on board with shared values of the open competition and eventual democracy. Strategic partner 1998 was being seen as a rival in 2008, and in 2018, you just saw three weeks ago the statement by the Vice President Pence, that China is an adversary. It's an adversary at a Cold War that America must win. And we're seeing uh, very significantly the corporates invested in China being encouraged, as, as uh, Prime Minister Hun Sen said, to look at alternative factories with a major suggestion that what is invested in China should relocate to Vietnam as a first, first stop. Yeah. But that's just one level. I think there are two other things that we, must, we need to be important, careful about. Regionalism, particularly in the developing world, is a critical consideration at a time of building outward progressive integration. Building localized value chains in the regions is a, a predecessor, a learning experience to finding a niche in the global value chains, particularly at a time 
when the competition and the Cold War and anti militarism is rewriting the global value chains, making them shorter and leaving out some areas. But there's another form of regionalism which is not the same as what we are now talking about. If you look at the recent USMCA, the, the, the alternative to NAFTA, US-Mexico-Canada agreement, many people have said it is the, the same as NAFTA, but the truth is that there are some distinct changes. One very clear change is this. They raise the bar of rules of origin. 90% of content must come from Canada, Mexico, and the US. There are two components of that. The first component is that you make it more difficult for traditional players in value chains in the automobile industry to, to play a role. But the second component is that Canada and Mexico are tied into conditions under which they cannot negotiate market access relationship with China. Mm -hmm. So th that's one phenomenon. But fundamentally, I want to say the following. Multilateralism is a victim of Cold War on the frontier of technology. The world needs multilateralism. Two messages we have to address. We have to improve the glo globalization as a method of delivering an inclusive prosperity. And the second message is that starting in the regions, but going to the world, we must all be ready to say, common challenges need common global solutions. The spirit of multilateralism is important. I want on behalf of Angta to say, Thank you very much, Excellencies, for starting this conversation. Over the next few days, we're going to have very many related sessions with hundreds of speakers and thousands of audience to enrich our dialogue on how can we resuscitate commitment and the momentum of sustainable development goals in the headwinds of anti-globalization and its attendant effects on multilateralism. Thank you very much. Dr. Kitu, you are a very persuasive champion of multilateralism and have brought our summit to a conclusion most aptly. Here concludes the Global Leaders Investment Summit. One, let us show our appreciation for our global leaders who have joined us on the panel. From Namibia, the President, His Excellency, Mr. Hage Geingo. From Cambodia, Prime Minister Samde Chakamoha Senapatai Techo Hun Sen. Mr. Ang Yushef has left us, as we saw. Um, from the World Federation of Stock Exchanges, Ms. Nandini Sukumar, the CEO. And from Siemens Financial, Mr. Roland Chalon-Brown, also CEO.